please be seated. Welcome to the Spring 2023 Convocation of the University of Arizona James E. Rogers College of Law. First things first, congratulations graduates, you have earned this day. On this bright, warm, but not too warm day in the desert, we honor the history of this space. We respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Odom and the Yaqui. <laughs> Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with Native nations and indigenous communities through educational offerings, partnerships, and community service. In this 108th year of our University of Arizona College of Law, we honor each of you. And I really mean you, our graduates across all programs. But we do not walk this earth alone. You have chosen both a place and a profession that is built on people, built on we, not I. The trip has been a long one, both metaphorically and physically, for many of you, as well as for your families. Many have traveled here today from the ends of our country and continent. Some have traveled literally across the planet. So we honor all of those who had a hand in getting you to this day. Welcome all. Some special guests join us on stage this afternoon, each of whom will be formally introduced later in the program. But thank you all for being here. Also joining us on the stage are those who have dedicated their professional lives to your education and who made it possible for you to imagine this day, graduation. We have been your mentors, your helpers, your friends. We have been your navigators, even as you undoubtedly asked yourselves at time where we were going. I will call the names of faculty and administrators, ask them to stand and request that you hold your applause until all introductions are made. Barbara Atwood, Jane Bambauer, Seva Priya Barrier, Paul Bennett, Luis Pergola, Sylvia Lett Canellis, Andrew Cohn, James Diamond, Tessa Dysart, Janice Gallego, David Gantz, Robert Glennon, Christopher Griffin, Charles Harrington, Joy Hercadillo, Robert Hershey, James Hopkins, Shell Chen Hu, Christine Husky, Mona Imel, Willie Jordan Curtis, Nagar Katarai, Jason Craig, Eunice Lee, Lori Lewis, Lynn Marcus, Tony Massaro, Teresa Miguel Stearns, Shafali Melcharik Desai, Robert Mundheim, Lena Nguyen King, Shalev Reisman, Susan Salmon, Andrew Shepard, Andrew Silverman, Diana Simon, Stephanie Stern, Keith Swisher, Mary Beth Tucker, Tammy Walker, Jamie Weber, 
and Jordan Woods. Faculty and administrators, with one exception, Robert Glennon, please be seated. You're an exception. Please stand. <laughs> Robert. Thank you. You know, once someone retires, I have no power whatsoever to <laughs> even ask them to stand a well. Robert Glennon has been a treasured member of our community for almost 40 years. In a bittersweet moment for us all, he taught his final class at the College of Law last month. Robert now embarks on his next and well-deserved journey. It is impossible to define what Robert has meant to us here at the college. He's been a passionate educator, a mentor to both students and colleagues, and a trusted friend. His work in water law has literally redefined the field, and his environmental advocacy is inspiring and impact far-reaching. We'll greatly miss his collegiality, his intellect, and his presence in our halls. Please join me in thanking Professor Robert Glennon for his many years of service. We are, as you all know, and as you embody, a school without borders, walls, or spatial limitations. Part of being without these kinds of limitations means having students across programs from many countries, many indigenous nations and groups, and many states. A perfect example of this would be our tremendous 240 students who graduated with a Bachelor of Law degree this week, it's those students hailing from all over the country and indeed the world. And several weeks from now, I will celebrate the graduation of another 100 students in that program in Qingdao, China. Those students, and all of you, truly exemplify this absence of spatial limitations, and we are all the richer because of it, you come from a diverse array of backgrounds and experiences, and each of you, and only you on some level, know the journal journey that you took to get here today. The incredible diversity of our graduates is reflected in the speakers you will hear from and the programs you will hear about. Class of 2023, today is a day of remembering how you got to this point. It is a day of pure celebration and joy and a day where we look forward to where you will go and what you will do with your new and substantial powers. You joined us, in some cases, a year ago or two, three, four, who's counting? <laughs> For those of us who joined in 2020, the last three years may have felt like one year or occasionally like 10. Regardless of your journey, each of you brought your own passions, experiences, relationships, geographies, politics, religions, perspectives, and dreams. And we have come to know you well as individuals in all the richness and complexity of human life, as individuals and members of many communities. We admire your deep and profound character, your talent, your resilience, all of which will accrue to your personal benefit going forward. But your character and gifts will also serve others. They will serve the we. As you make your mark on your community, society, and indeed, and this is not hyperbole, on the world. Suffice it to say, we live in extraordinary times. Artificial intelligence no longer exists simply in the realm of science fiction. Chat GPT and other similar AI chatbots loom on the horizon for any profession that employs the written word as its medium. Additionally, 
As the world becomes increasingly technological and connected, concerns about privacy and even our so-called right to be forgotten arise as uniquely 21st century challenges. And interwoven through all of this, and perhaps even in part because of it, we have been called to re-examine many of the fundamental tenets of our democracy. The founders of our country could not have envisioned the endemic misinformation that reaches millions of people in the blink of an eye. And the resolution of this will be the great challenge of your generation. It is these extraordinary times that your generation of legal professionals will be called on to imagine and then reshape justice in new complex ways, in scales local to global and in ways physical and digital. Your generation, you, as policymakers and social influencers must now confront these social, economic, political, technological, and environmental challenges. By virtue of your training and our hopes and expectations, you have been prepared to answer these challenges. I hope you will both wrestle with and ultimately embrace the task of anchoring your role and law's role to conceptions of justice and equality and truth and autonomy and in profound ways what it means to be human. Your generation of graduates is at this moment shaping what it means to be an active citizen both in your countries and communities and indeed a citizen of the world. And again, your legal training and your experience put you in a position to lead. But as we all know and have felt, the last few years have presented unique trials and you bring a wide array of those life experiences to bear as well. You have learned to work and think and have multidimensional lives even when life seemed to shrink to the size of a Zoom screen. That ability to adapt quickly and thrive will be valuable over the course of your life. You've learned to live with ambiguity, with risk, with uncertainty, with losses and sorrow, but you remain standing. You have extended compassion and care to those around you and you have learned and we have seen you learn the importance of self-care. These past few years there's been much cause for concern there is also much cause for hope. We have seen the worst, but we have seen the best of human nature laid bare. We know challenging times persist, and your legal education qualifies you in a very exceptional way to step up to these challenges. You are among those who will meet this moment. We know you are ready. There are three things I ask you to do. First insist on the search for truth. You have learned about outcomes produced by particular sets of facts. Yet we live at a time when the market value of facts is eroding before our eyes. The truth tethers us to each other in ways that falsehoods cannot. You know this because you have sat beside and argued with and broken bread with people very different from you and even so you have managed to find common ground. Not necessarily agreement, but common ground. You have learned the mechanisms for exploring truth through law, process, and institutions. Though tattered and under pervasive threat, the deep values anchored in the profound idea of due process and the rule of law remain vital. But we ask you and you are called on to apply your skills, knowledge, and fidelity to truth irrespective of external forces that would ask you to do otherwise. Please take it head on. My second request is this, demand the ends of justice. Embrace those values that reflect analysis, reason, reflection, compassion, and in this endeavor, don't confuse the rule of law with merely defending the status quo. Recognize the power and inequality embodied in existing law, in our rules, in our procedures, in our institutions, and it is our greatest and most honorable tradition to create and sustain the institutions and processes that reflect our society's commitment to peaceful and orderly progress, not merely accepting the status quo, but by challenging it 
by changing it, by improving it. Finally, I'm gonna ask you to do something we already know you can do. We saw you do it every day. You're doing it today with joy. Stay engaged. It is not just refrigerator magnet wisdom that the world is changed by people who show up. It's one of life's subtle truths. Show up for your clients, your coworkers, your community as you figure out how to serve it. Show up for your friends in distress as well as in their times of joy and celebration. Show up even if there's no free pizza. <laughs> Class of 2023, SJDs, LLMs, MLSs, MPSs, graduate certificate earners, and JDs, get ready to roll. You can do this. You should be confident that you can do this. We need leaders, we need reason, we need you. Thank you. So graduates, today you begin a new life with Arizona Law. You morph from students to alumni. There's some magic words later, that's the moment that happens. Here to welcome you to the alumni community is Eric Button, class, JD class of 2001, the incoming president of the Law College Association, of which, upon formal graduation, you are automatically now members. Eric. Thank you, Dean. Dean Miller, graduates, family and friends, and honored guests, I'm honored to be here and excited for our graduates. In addition to the usual rigors of law, of law school, as the dean said, you have endured strange times with COVID protocols, as well as other trying events in the university community over the last few years. You successfully obtained your degree through all of this. Congratulations on staying the course and graduating. You're one step closer to being part of a noble profession that can help change lives and communities for the, for the better. You're also part of a population that is dear to me, the University of Arizona College of Law graduates. There are alum whose positive contributions can be, be felt throughout, the, throughout Arizona, the United States, and throughout many parts of the world. The examples range from significant case law advocacy and legal access to, for people who are underserved, the environment, legal and judicial integrity, and even instances helping other countries on how to reframe their own legal structure. I'm grateful for all of the many graduates and alum who have personally inspired my love for the law over the years. And constantly, I'm constantly amazed of the incredible students that enroll and succeed here. As the Dean said, you're now a member of the Law College Association. It is comprised of more than 7,000 alumni and supporters and, and supports Arizona law. One way to continue to strengthen the already outstanding education and the opportunity here at the Law College is to stay involved, keep in touch, become involved with the, with the LCA, the Law College Association, share your successes, your stumbling blocks, your ideas, the opportunities to contribute are endless. As you progress in your careers and lives, every so often, take, take a moment to mentally step back, be proud of your hard work, be grateful for the tools and opportunities you have worked for, then ponder what you can do to stay inspired and how to make the best use of your abilities and talents. Thank you for letting me mention a few things you already know and that others will tell you probably a little more eloquently. My degree from Arizona Law has allowed me to help and impact thousands of individuals. I've loved every day of my career. I hope you will love every day of your career in law. Thank you. Every year, those of us work regularly with student organizations 
and in doing so have the chance to establish a new and deep professional connection with officers of the Student Bar Association. This year, it was our pleasure to get to know Sarah Gerstel. Sarah was a skilled and deft leader, helping SBA create programming and initiatives that enriched the whole community. She voiced your concerns well, thoughtfully, but firmly identifying collective needs. She was a great advocate on your behalf, I assure you. This is not a surprise. Anyone who knows Sarah knows about her passion for advocacy and her unvarnished enthusiasm for change. These traits will serve her well after graduation when she will join the Monterey County Public Defender's Office. The galvaning force behind your class of 2023 class gift, I give you Sarah Gerstel. Hello and congratulations. Like Dean Miller just said, my name is Sarah Gerstel, and I had the honor of serving as the president of the Student, student Bar Association this past year. And I'm here today to talk to you about the class gift. A class gift is a contribution that a graduating class makes for the benefit of their soon-to-be alma mater. We are so grateful that this tradition often includes the support of not only students, but their loved ones as well. When we sat down to start brainstorming what our class gift would be, one theme kept coming up, accessibility. As many of you know, entering the legal profession can be prohibitively expensive. But we're about to enter this profession, and we have the opportunity and the moral obligation to leave it better than we found it. Today is a day that you and your loved ones have probably envisioned since your first day of law school orientation whether it was in person or on Zoom. For your family and your friends, this is the mark of a welcome end to our complaints about seemingly endless readings. And for students, you've probably envisioned yourself in the robe and the tam and the hood that no one really knows how to wear. Most of us were able to borrow this regalia for free, thanks to the class of 2013's class gift. But there weren't enough for all of us, and we lose some to wear and tear every year. So our class gift is purchasing more regalia to ensure that graduation stays accessible to everyone. As you leave Arizona law and go out into the world, I urge you to put your degree to good use. Make this profession more accessible. Use this opportunity to lift others up. Be a mentor. Pay your interns. Support students the way that you... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Support students the way that you've been supported and the way that you wish you'd been supported. And for the friends and family here today, I welcome you to show your support for the graduating class. You can make a donation by going to givetoarizonalaw.org and scrolling to the 2023 class gift. Donate to the class gift to allow every graduating law student to celebrate the hard work and the growth that they've experienced here at Arizona Law. Thank you. As our first class speaker, Kimberly Otieno represents students graduating from our Master of Laws program. We ask her to share a few words as she exemplifies the amazing things that our students are capable of. Thank you. It is an absolute privilege to address my fellow graduates, esteemed faculty members, and special guests and the loved ones who have assembled here today. I'm incredibly honored and grateful for this opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. As we commemorate graduating from University of Arizona, we must pause and ponder the two prominent themes that have unequivocally defined our journey, which will be resilience and diversity. Let's take a moment and acknowledge the most outstanding quality that has brought us here today resilience, despite facing hurdles like demanding study hours and setbacks, we have 
not given up, and we have emerged victorious. Our unwavering determination has proven our, our capability to accomplish anything and conquer obstacles and appear even more robust. At the University of Arizona, we pride ourselves on embracing diversity and resilience as integral components of our community. We recognize and appreciate the rich tapestry of backgrounds, stories, and perspectives everyone brings to our campus. These unique experiences and talents are highly valued and provide continuous learning and growth for all of us. Diversity is an essential pillar of our society, surpassing a mere buzzword or obligation to meet. Instead, the, it's the bedrock that fortifies our strength and adaptability and an unnegotiable force of our existence. Of our existence. Through emb embracing diversity, we unlock an invaluable trove of perspectives fostering an appreciation for distinct cultures and uniting towards shared objectives. As we move on from this institution, we must remember the importance of resilience and diversity. We must strengthen our ability to face challenges head on and come out even more potent. At the same time, we must recognize and appreciate our unique differences and work towards establishing a just and equitable community for all. Despite the challenges of global pandemics and social injustice, we have the strength, diversity, and determination to overcome them through hard work. We have already positively impacted the world and will continue pushing toward a better future with confidence. As I conclude, I want to dedicate this speech to my beloved mother. She unfortunately could not attend this event, but I'm sure she's currently watching me from Kenya. I am immensely grateful for your steadfast love and support throughout my journey. Your teachings on hard work, dedication, and perseverance have driven my success. I made it this far with you. Thank you for your sacrifice um, to give me the best opportunities in life. Thank you for your unwavering support and love. This degree signifies my academic accomplishments and the in invaluable guidance you have provided me during challenging moments. I'm determined to continue making you proud as I embark on your journeys. Happy Mother's Day. Um, I am grateful. I want to extend my sincere congratulations to my fellow Wildcats on this incredible achievement. Our hard work and dedication have certainly paid off and we should take pride in our success. However, we must remember that this is only the beginning of our journey. We must focus on elevating our physical and mental abilities, embracing our unique qualities and collaborating to create a more inclusive and fair society. Your unwavering efforts and resolute commitment are greatly appreciated. Thank you. Kimberly, thank you. Your classmates, of course, know your amazing background, but for other friends and family, let me add a little bit of her bio. Uh, as you know, she joined us from the other side of the world, spending her formative years in Nairobi, Kenya. There she studied both at the University of Nairobi and received her law degree from the Kenya School of Law. She is currently an advocate of the highest court of Kenya. I also wanted to I also wanted to mention that she has particularly expressed admiration for two faculty who were mentors and asked me to note her respect for professors Orbach and Dubovich who like her started their professional journeys in America with the same LLM degree that she 
is conferred today. What an inspiration. Kimberly will next sit for the New York Bar before joining the legal division at R.R. R. Donnelly. Next, we have Jennifer Chambers representing our Masters of Legal Studies program. Jennifer embodies the phrase I used before, no spatial limitations, as she completes her degree entirely online from Pennsylvania. However, there is still a physical world that matters and we are so glad she has joined us today in person. When asked what stood out from her time with us, Jennifer emphasized how much she valued her work as a course assistant and supporting other students and staff. She will next pursue a career as a professor as she commences her PhD. So this is not the only ceremony for her to look forward to as she will be getting married later this year. Please welcome Jennifer Chambers. Thank you for your kind words and introduction, Dean Miller. Good afternoon, everyone. Congratulations to my fellow graduates on this amazing accomplishment. First, I would like to thank all of the professors, faculty members, administration, as well as family and friends for all of your support and guidance over the past few years. I would especially like to thank my mom for always supporting me and being my biggest advocate. We have all heard the term bear down while attending the University of Arizona. Each of us understands this phrase as our university motto in defining us collectively as Wildcats, whether hearing it on campus, in our fight song, or even at the end of an email exchange. I believe Bear Down represents each one of us as individuals, and each of us has our own perspective on what it means. I was first made aware of this unique Wildcat phrase at a young age. My late father was also a University of Arizona graduate, and my goal was to not only follow his legacy, but also to learn what exactly Bear Down means. For as long as I can remember, I knew the words to our fight song without ever stepping foot on campus. To me, Bear Down Arizona means not only to fight, but to persevere and never give up. Perseverance, legacy, and gratitude are three terms which I associate with our motto, Bear Down. First, Perseverance is something that I have experienced throughout my graduate studies. When I initially entered the MLS program, I was presented with several challenges, including my first experience in an online education platform, as well as a full-time remote working environment due to the pandemic. I know many of my fellow colleagues can attest to similar situations and setbacks. As the year progressed, I faced my biggest challenge, which was the loss of my father after a battle with cancer. At that moment, my world shattered and I wanted to quit, but quitting is not the wildcat way. Throughout my entire life, my father always told me about his experiences at the University of Arizona and how much he loved the campus. I always knew that I wanted to be a wildcat as well and eventually see all of his favorite places. Before starting my first semester, my dad and I agreed that we would both walk at graduation upon the completion of my degree as he did not attend his formal ceremonies. Even though he is not physically with me today, attending graduation remained as one of my major goals. However, it was not easy since I reside in Pennsylvania, but I persevered and completed my degree, book flights, and stand before you today. <laughs> I reference the term legacy as a word that I think of when I try to define bear down. To me, legacy allows for hope for the future as well as remembering the past. As a second generation Wildcat, I am honored to have followed in my father's footsteps and hope my future family members can one day carry on the Wildcat tradition. Each of us has established our own Wildcat legacy by graduating today and taking the next steps in our lives. My experiences have shown me that the call to all of us is to persevere. I challenge each of us to take a chance on something different or unexpected, book a flight to somewhere new, 
Stand up for someone in need. And most of all, stand up against the injustices in our society that we face today. As Wildcat graduates, we can do anything. Congratulations to all MLS, MPS, JD, LLM, SJD, and certificate recipients. I am so honored to have been selected as your MLS class speaker and wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Always remember to continue to persevere in times of difficulty, make your own legacy, and have gratitude for those who helped you along the way. Bear down, Wildcat graduates. I am so proud of you. Speakers elected by the JD class of 2023 are Jacob Marsh and Geneva Parks, both recognized as student leaders and passionate advocates for the communities they will someday serve. During his time here, Jacob participated in the Child and Family Law Clinic, Environmental Mood Court, the Legal Writing Center, and Justice Advocates Coalition. We asked Jacob what stood out from his time and he was open about the experience of attending law school during a global pandemic, attending classes over Zoom, feeling isolated in a new city, and the thought your classmates have a better, better handle on law school than you do. We recently passed through a time that required us to distance socially and engage primarily through digital medium, and it was easy to forget that we were experiencing many of the same hardships. I know the challenges Jacob faced were shared by many of you, by many of us, that he is here today and that we celebrate his accomplishments, as we do all of your accomplishments, is a testament to his character and perseverance. Moving forward, Jacob will be joining the Pima County Public Defender's Office, where his character and perseverance will be essential as he works to defend the rights of others. Next, we will have Geneva Parks. Geneva served as both a member and vice president of the Native American Law Students Association. She is also a member of the National Lawyers Guild, where she helped plan the Southwest People's Law Conference. Advocacy has been a theme throughout Geneva's Arizona law career. She participated in our International Human Rights Advocacy Workshop, the Tribal Justice Clinic, and has been active in the Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy Program. Geneva described IPLP as central to her time here, particularly working with Jose Francisco Calice, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. She plans to continue her advocacy work, joining Rothstein Donatelli and their nationally recognized Indian law practice. She also continues as a student pursuing her master's degree in Latin American studies. I would first like to welcome Jacob Marsh to the podium. Thank you, Dean Miller, and thank you all for being here today. When I started writing this speech, I really struggled with what I should say. I wanted to be funny and also sincere and also short, uh, but I couldn't find the words. For inspiration, I decided to look up some of history's most famous speeches. As any good millennial would, I got bored pretty quickly and stopped looking. I did settle on the most famous speech that I could think of, though. It was the acceptance speech for Northeastern Pennsylvania's Salesman of the Year Award, <laughs> given in 2006 at the Radisson in Lackawanna by none other than Dwight Kurt Schrute. <laughs> and in his honor, I decided to start my speech with a quote. In my professional responsibility course, the strange man speaking at the front of the room once said this, after you graduate law school, nobody is going to care about what grades you got or what journal you were on or how much you got paid last summer. After you graduate law school, what matters is how you treat people. And I must admit, as a middling student who didn't make law review and worked most summers for free, this was music to my ears. But that wasn't why it resonated so much. 
I remember that quote because it reminded me what the legal profession is really about. As law school graduates, we'll be joining a profession that is all about service. We will have the responsibility to serve our communities, our clients, and in my case, some very litigation-happy parents. I mean it, every week it's, hello son, somebody cut me off in the grocery store parking lot, how can I sue them? <laughs> in my opinion, the biggest part of that responsibility is a commitment to look out for each other. And whether we knew it or not, we were doing that all throughout law school. Many of us met our first friends here through a computer screen. And as tough as it was, they were the ones who got us out of the house when law school got tough. We had professors who went above and beyond to make sure we had answers to our questions and our insecurities. And others who made us, once a week for a whole semester, write down the things we were grateful for. Even on our laptops, we were starting to learn what being a lawyer means. And that was our life for the hardest year of law school. It was Zoom meetings and D2L announcements. So when we finally made it to campus, it was just the smallest bit annoying that we were greeted by ungrateful, entitled 1Ls <laughs> who had the gall to complain about handwriting notes or in-person finals. But we also served as their TAs, as their sounding boards, and as student leaders who brought events and speakers to campus that made our school feel whole. And whether we did that intentionally or not, we were practicing looking out for each other. And now we're here. And many of us are going to be leaving this support system behind. But no matter where we go, it is still our responsibility to look out for each other. For example, statistically, some of us will face bar discipline. <laughs> and when Fletcher is inevitably called <laughs> before the state bar of Arizona, of course I will be a character witness for him. <laughs> I think what I'm trying to say is that in the big bad world, looking out for each other matters. After we graduate law school, how we treat each other really does matter. So I asked my fellow graduates and their friends and families to do your best to treat each other well. And to remember that sometimes weird old guys in PR classes give pretty good advice. Thank you. I would now like to hand it over to my classmate and fellow graduate, Geneva Parks. Um, thank you so much for choosing me as one of your speakers today. I feel really humbled to be standing up here before you. I came to law school because I wanted a revolution, and I've spent a lot of the last three years wondering if I made the right choice. I was hungry for radical change, a world where people could live with dignity and self-determination, and I thought maybe foolishly that a legal education would help me gain insight into the inner workings of the system. I thought I would learn its weaknesses. Shortly after I accepted my offer to attend Arizona Law, a global pandemic caused a seismic shift in the way we all navigate our day-to-day -day lives. We kept our distance from each other, terrified of not knowing what a brief interaction could mean for our health or the health of our loved ones. But the other side of that coin was, we found new ways to connect deeply. We planted gardens, called our friends more often. Mutual aid groups grew in numbers, as did opportunities to redistribute wealth. Flagrant injustices against black and indigenous peoples filled our news feeds. The pandemic made visible how others might be experiencing situations we take for granted. We toughened up even as we got a little bit more vulnerable. The pandemic also made us, or at least me, creepier, but 
we can't really be blamed for this. We did our entire first year of law school on Zoom. We knew each other's names without having to ask. Bathed in the harsh blue light of our computer screens, we studied each other's faces and pieced together who our class was from the neck up. Fortunately, someone taught me early on about pinning a classmate's video to the speaker view so I could look at the rooms you were all zooming in from. <laughs> Since I couldn't physically share space with you, I committed myself to figuring out who you were based on your home decor. <laughs> During 1L year, I was busy admiring your stained glass window or wondering where you got your plants and equally busy forgetting whether a contract drunkenly drafted on a napkin would hold up in a court of law. <laughs> but I welcomed this shift in perspective. It distracted me from my discomfort at becoming intimately acquainted with the way legal doctrines often uphold systems of power and the sense that I was being taught how to preserve these practices rather than think critically about their consequences. Over time, I came to understand these years in law school as a series of shifts in perspective. Away from the harm the law sometimes causes and toward the creative ways that those most impacted by the law leverage it to advance their rights. Away from revolution as a singular event that changes the fundamental structures within which we struggle and toward the notion that revolution is a daily commitment to the small tender ways that we fight back. The hardest part of law school was not learning the law. The hardest part was how few spaces are built in to dream new worlds. For my colleagues engaged in work to uplift humanity, I'm looking at you, pinning your little Zoom window and seeing you all sweaty in your graduation gowns. <laughs> Whatever your struggle is, whether it's against the state or against union busting companies, whether it's ending carceral punishment or ending the criminalization of land and water protectors. I hope and I know that you have the strength and vision to continue to dream new worlds. Arizona law placed me in community with people fighting back. The responsibility we shoulder is both great and seemingly inconsequential. It's short and long term, defying any describable unit of measure or time. It's about carrying on the work of generations past and building something for the future, the finished product of which we'll likely never see. This work is not easy. It'll tear you apart and put you back together again, and figuring out where the pieces go is one of the most intellectually demanding things you can imagine. But there is so much joy and meaning in the process. So I want to conclude by thanking you for laughing and complaining and scheming with me. Thank you, because even when I felt isolated, I never felt alone. Because you've taught me and learned with me and really seen me through this whole thing. And I've loved walking along alongside you. Congratulations to each and every one of you. Thank you all. Our student speakers are going to leave the stage now, joining their classmates and friends for the remainder of today's ceremony. Now I am thrilled to introduce your keynote speaker. I spoke earlier of how you would make your mark on your communities, your societies, and the world. I stressed that this was not hyperbole, and I am now prepared to prove it. Your keynote speaker made her mark on her communities by being a trailblazer in her field. She is the first South Asian judge to sit on the country's largest federal appeals court. She made her mark on society by being a superlative attorney, litigating some of the highest profile Arizona cases of the last 
four years. She was named the Arizona honoree among USA Today's Women of the Year due to her work defending President Biden's election victory in Arizona. And she continues to make her mark on the world every day by being an amazing, caring, and kind human being, both personally and professionally. Having been in exactly your shoes, it is all the more meaningful that she is here today to speak to you. She's a triple wildcat, earning her Bachelor of Arts, Master of Public Health, and Juris Doctor from the University of Arizona. Before joining the court, she was in private practice as a partner at the Phoenix law firm of Coppersmith Brockelman, where she specialized in complex civil litigation and the law of politics, political law. She was a leading election lawyer and handled numerous trials and appellate matters prior to becoming a judge. In addition to being an alumna, she maintains a close connection to the college. As a professor of practice, we could not be more proud to welcome her home. Please join me in welcoming Judge Rupali Desai. Thank you, Dean Miller, for your gracious introduction and kind words. I'm truly honored to be here today and to share in this very joyous occasion. Greetings, University of Arizona, James E. Rogers College of Law graduates. I want to extend my gratitude to you for inviting me here to be your graduation speaker and inviting me to share some of my story to offer what I hope are some useful tips as you embark on your unique JD journeys, and of course, to celebrate your great achievement. Graduating from law school is a tremendous accomplishment. It requires years of hard work, dedication, and sacrifice. You should be proud of yourselves for reaching this milestone. But like any success, past, present, or future, you did not and will not achieve it alone. So before anything else, I want to thank and congratulate your families, your friends, your mentors, and the law school faculty and staff without whom this day would not have been possible. Let's give them all a round of applause. As I stand before you today, almost 20 years after graduating from this very institution, so the last time I graduated from this institution, I'm reminded about how disorienting law school was at times for me. I did not have any lawyers in my family. In fact, I can recall only talking to one lawyer in my life before going to law school. My parents were immigrants from India and did not have any depth of knowledge or personal experience with the American legal system. As a result, I did not know much about the laws or the courts of this country, and I did not know any of those strange legal terms you start learning in law school. I thought supra was a type of car. <laughs> I thought infra was a part of a scientific term describing the electromagnetic spectrum, which, by the way, is consistent with being Indian and starting as a pre-med student. <laughs> and what was a term of art if not something to do with painting, drawing, or sculpture? And I'm sure that all of you have felt varying degrees of disorientation and doubt during your law school experience. And the feeling may not have passed entirely for you yet. And even if it has, you should be prepared to feel it again and again at different points in your professional career. Like when you start a new law job, or step into a courtroom for the first time. For me, I still experience this feeling from time to time, like recently when I made the transition from being a lawyer on one side of the bench to being a federal judge on the other side. I mention this even though it's not an inherently happy thing to talk about your discomfort and disorientation, but instead because it's important to recognize that, they ha that you have an option when you're feeling this way. And instead of giving up or taking the easy road in moments where I lacked clarity, direction, and confidence, I embraced at least three principles 
And of course, as lawyers, we all talk about things in threes. So I'm gonna talk to you today about those three principles which I still follow today. And I hope that they may prove helpful to you as you start your journey. First, I'll talk about the ships. They're necessary for success. Mentorship, allyship, and sponsorship. These things are different, even though people often confuse them. A mentor is someone you watch with admiration, someone who motivates you, and from whom you seek guidance. An ally is someone who promotes you, someone who advocates for your interests and takes action to support you, even when you're not standing there. And a sponsor is someone who uses their influence and personal capital to amplify your strengths, connect you with the right people, and give you the opportunities to shine. You'll not always know when you have these people around you, and often they can be the people that you least expect. And for that reason, you should keep an open mind and freely agree to meet, talk with, and work with many different types of people in your communities. And you should rely on your mentors, allies, and sponsors to help you find your way. I've had many mentors, allies, and sponsors along the way. They are the people who have taken notice of my unique background or different perspective and have helped me pave the road that I now walk on. I'll never forget the senior lawyer at my very first law firm job who insisted that I meet his friend, who happened to be a Ninth Circuit judge, because he thought I had something unique to offer as a law clerk. Never in a million years did I think that a man of Irish descent, born in Boston in 1929, would open the first door for me to get me to where I am today. So on this first point, look for these people in your, moment, in your moments of uncertainty. And don't forget to be one of the ships for someone else. This is where I steal a childish phrase from my five-year-old and apply it to my advice on mentorship, allyship, and sponsorship. It takes one to know one. <laughs> the second principle that I've embraced when I'm feeling disoriented is to work towards something that is bigger than myself. If you think about it, when you're experiencing unease with something, it's very likely that others are experiencing the same thing. And to think about the problem that needs to be solved is not just your problem, but a problem that requires a bigger, broader, and bolder solution can help you move past the moment of panic and also serve those around you. I remember how foreign law school felt to me when I first started. And that led me to think about how inaccessible the law is to most people who will never go to law school. You, like me, will eventually be able to navigate our laws and legal system. You, like me, will hopefully work to ensure that our legal system has the full confidence of our citizenry. But there are many, many others who are not like us. I am worried about our public institutions and Americans' confidence in our legal system and the judiciary today. It's imperative that as graduates of this esteemed institution and with the privilege of having received a legal education, and I'm gonna say that again because it's really important, the privilege of having received a legal education, you must find ways to work for something bigger than yourself. The law provides the framework and basis for protecting our rights, holding those in power accountable, maintaining order and advancing justice. You now not only have the knowledge and skills necessary to use the law as a tool to improve our communities, but you also have a responsibility to do so. John Lewis said that democracy is not a state, it is an act. This is as true today as it has ever been. Law safeguards our democracy, and each of us, lucky enough to learn how to harness the law, has a duty to uphold and enforce those safeguards whenever the opportunity arises. We also each have a responsibility to abstain from exploiting weaknesses in the law or in our institutions, even if doing so would be personally beneficial. The way I see it, we are each charged with three inexhaustible obligations. First, promoting justice. Second, strengthening our institutions of justice. And third, promoting confidence in our institutions. 
Throughout history, individuals have used the law to change lives and improve society. It was the law that gave women the right to vote, the right to own property, and the right to work in jobs that were previously closed to them. It was the law that desegregated schools and neighborhoods and began the long march towards racial equality that continues today. These are monumental triumphs, achievements that generations of advocates have since worked to build upon. But through our rightful focus on the work yet to be done, we sometimes lose sight of the importance of safeguarding the building blocks laid down so long ago. That foundation is essential, and we are realizing that we must continue to advocate for and strengthen those building blocks. Part of your work will be safeguarding the advances already made. Of course, it's also important to look forward and build on the achievements of past generations. Nelson Mandela's autobiography outlines the advances he believes society had made and the work that remained. He saw the end of formal segregation as only, quote, the first step on a longer and even more difficult road. Because to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. I urge each of you to continue fighting for justice prospectively, to advocate in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others, but I implore you not to assume that the past victories are immutable if we do not advocate for them. Democracy, after all, is an act. And to do that, you must have and promote open conversations about policies, ideas, legal positions, and current events with people who may not have the knowledge that you have, or simply they disagree with you. In the short two decades since graduating from law school, I have seen an exponential rise in intolerance emanating from both sides. And this happens when we're discussing issues that affect all of us. And that intolerance is eroding the common ground on which our public institutions are built. I implore you to push back against this one-sidedness and try to see the nuance in each situation. Doing so will strengthen our institutions and rebuild people's confidence in them. Let me give you an example of how this played out in my life not so long ago. You may have heard that Arizona was at the center of some controversy relating to the 2020 election. As Dean Miller said, I was a practicing election lawyer before I became a judge, and at that time, I was hired to defend against several lawsuits trying to change elections procedures before the election, to challenge the outcome of the election after the results were in, and I was also involved in litigation challenging the transparency and safeguards relating to a post-election audit that made headlines around the world. I'll take an opportunity here to make a side remark about how small the legal community is. No matter where you practice, you should expect to encounter many of the same people over and over again in the practice of law. This is especially true if you're in a specialized practice area like I was. So I was not surprised to learn that several lawyers who I often found on the other side of me were my opposing counsel in the 2020 election cases. While I felt confident in those cases that my clients' positions were correct, but I, I nevertheless took the opportunity to engage with my opposing counsel to try to understand their clients' points of views. And through that process, in several of those cases, we were able to come to a resolution or significantly narrow the scope of the litigation. And I'm hard pressed to think of a situation more polarizing than the 2020 election. But in several of those lawsuits, the lawyers who spoke to one another were able to find common ground. Law school has prepared you to have those kinds of conversations that I'm talking about, and to see all sides of a matter that you're working on. You should hone those skills and resist the urge to abandon them simply because you have a client with a singular objective or because your opponent is frustratingly myopic, which will happen. And after all, I can tell you, as a judge, if you were to stand before me or any judge and dedicate your entire argument to your own strengths and ignore the points raised by the other side, you would lose. The same is true when grappling with complex topics like equality, 
health care, criminal justice, climate policy, immigration, and democracy. Our collective failure to listen and speak to each other calmly, respectfully, and persuasively carries us all from the, further away from the society in which we wish to live. So I encourage you to use the skills you learned these past few years to improve our discourse, even when others fail to do so. Of course, engaging in respectful and open-minded dialogue is good for you as a lawyer and professionally and personally, but it's also good for the overall health of our legal system. The point I made a moment ago about how legal communities are small, I want to take a moment to talk to you a little bit about how having respectful and open-minded dialogues with your opposing counsel, with judges, with people in the community, how you conduct yourself daily and on a case-by-case -case basis, it will define you and can significantly impact your trajectory. Many people questioned whether somebody like me, a political lawyer who litigated some of Arizona's most controversial cases in recent history, could be confirmed as a federal circuit judge. And while it is true that I was a passionate advocate for my clients, many of my most formidable adversaries wrote letters on my behalf when I was nominated for the court by President Biden. And they said that they supported me, not because they agreed with my legal positions all the time in the cases in which we litigated together, but because I was respectful, professional, and acted with integrity. And my motivation to be that kind of lawyer relates to something bigger than myself. It emanates from my desire to improve the integrity and reputation of our profession and to restore the integrity of our institutions and the judiciary. So this brings me to the third and final principle that I have relied on to get me to where I am today, despite experiencing moments of uncertainty along the way. And this principle is that you don't have to do law like everyone else. And it's usually better to do law in your own way. The practice of law is simply that, a practice. It requires constant learning and adjusting to new facts, new laws, new tribunals, and changes in our communities. You will also change, your life circumstances will change, and you will have many job opportunities throughout your career. While it is human nature to stick to what is comfortable, to maybe pick a job because of its title or its pay, I challenge you to keep growing and trying new things. Gone are the days when lawyers spend 50 years doing the same thing at the same place. Like I said earlier, we have a responsibility to be the change we want to see. But there is no one path, no right path to fulfilling that responsibility. And it is a fiction, perhaps the best example of a legal fiction, for those of you who love legalese, that you need not have a public interest job to make a public interest impact. It's simply not true. I went to law school after working as a public health advocate for child victims of abuse and domestic violence survivors. I certainly thought when I was going to law school that I would work in a public interest job when I graduated. After all, advocating for vulnerable populations and people without a strong voice was something that I felt passionate about. I did, in fact, spend my first summer working in the Arizona Attorney General's office representing the Department of Health Services and doing some of that public advocacy that I always thought I would do. But during my second year in law school, I decided to branch out and interview with some private firms. I was fortunate to meet several amazing female partners who encouraged me to try a law firm for my second summer. But I still felt very uncomfortable about the idea because one, I was committed to public interest. And two, I felt I did not fit in at the firms. Most people at the firms did not look like me, they did not come from similar backgrounds as me, and the whole concept of a private firm was so foreign to me. But I tried it, and that experience led me to a clerkship on the Ninth Circuit, and then to a smaller private law firm where I built a practice from scratch and became a partner and worked until I became a judge. My path was unconventional, it was unchartered, but it was my own. And I believe that a big reason I was successful is because I was not focused on my resume or promotion, but I was focused on what motivated me. I spent my time and energy on things that were meaningful to me. In my private practice, I advanced justice and the public's interest. 
And even before I developed my own practice at the firm, which was focused on high impact public interest litigation, I was committed to public interest work through serving on community boards and volunteering for various causes. By doing work that was meaningful, I never had to adopt the credo that I hear lawyers say all the time to young lawyers, which is fake it until you make it. I did not need to fake being something that I am not. I just worked really hard at being true to who I am and doing great work in furtherance of those values. I encourage all of you to do the same, whether you work in the private sector or the public sector. As graduates of this law school, you have a responsibility to uphold justice and fairness, to protect the vulnerable, and to use your power for good. And this obligation exists regardless of what job you hold. I started off today by telling you about the many things in law school that I did not know or understand when I first started. I think the most important one of those things is that we have endless opportunities as lawyers to change people's lives for the better. The road ahead will not always be easy or comfortable, but remember the principles that I shared. One, the ships, mentorship, allyship, and sponsorship. Two, work towards something bigger than yourself, especially in times like this when we need to restore public confidence in our institutions. And three, stay true to your values and give back to your community regardless of your career path. You have the knowledge, skills, and opportunity to make a difference, and I encourage all of you to carry out the responsibility that comes with the privilege of graduating today as a member of the James E. Rogers College of Law Class of 2023. I want to again congratulate you on this momentous achievement. Thank you and best of luck. Thank you, Judge Desai, for those thoughtful, wonderful words and the inspiration that your own journey that you described offers to our students as they begin their careers. Turning our attention to another kind of degree, I would first like to note that we have so few opportunities to truly celebrate the breadth and depth of a person's whole impact on the legal profession. So it is with immense pride today that we recognize our honorary degree recipient, the University of Arizona's honorary degree recipient, a colleague, a friend, and a true giant in his field, Professor Robert H. Mundheim. Last year, after a unanimous faculty vote, the College of Law nominated Professor Mundheim to receive an honorary doctorate of laws from the university. Bob's resume alone would have made him an eminently worthy recipient of this honor. He has 65 years of experience in high government positions, rarefied corporate settings, and as a leader in the academy. He's an active, internationally regarded leader in the area of corporate governance and the regulation of financial institutions. Among his many, many contributions in government, he played a substantial role with the U.S. delegation negotiating for the release of the Iranian hostages. His academic record is equally distinguished, including service as a former law school dean and professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He holds the Officer's Cross of Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany. He received the American Bar Association's highest award for professionalism, a word you've heard here. Bob's story is so much more than these accomplishments. Although, if I went through his whole CV, this ceremony would go on for another two hours. At the age of five, Bob and his parents fled Nazi rule. Family members who stayed behind were killed in the Holocaust. Bob has publicly spoken about coming to the US, describing it as an extraordinary 
life-saving opportunity that should be extended to new generations. Those already living here as well as those those living here as well as those seeking opportunity and safety, something we are seeing in the headlines and news on a daily basis. <laughs> this orientation and eagerness to help others to identify and create opportunity has been a purpose throughout Bob's life. He's formed close relationships with students men as a mentor, advising and making introductions uh, for jobs, offering beneficial connections. I know many of you have experienced this firsthand. We've seen the larger world he opens in terms of professional impact through the corporate governance class where he's brought renowned and influential legal minds to engage and inspire our students and our community. For these reasons, we were thrilled that our university recognized Bob, his life of service, and his commitment to our community by awarding him an honorary doctorate of laws, which he received last night at the main campus commencement. We consider this a capstone of an extraordinary career and can think of no one more deserving. Bob, thank you. Each year, the board of the Law College Association, whose incoming president, Eric Button, you heard from earlier, recognizes and honors community leaders and alumni for noteworthy achievements and dedicated service to the James E. Rogers College of Law, the University of Arizona, their communities, and their professions. This year, we recognize four such individuals who cover all of those reasons for recognition. We first bestow the LCA award upon Judith Leonard. Judith, would you please step forward? It is not an exaggeration to describe Judith's legal career as towering. She served as general counsel of the Smithsonian Institution for over a decade until her retirement this year. Prior to that, she served right here at the University of Arizona as Vice President and General Counsel, and before that as General Counsel of the Office of National Drug Control Policy in the Executive Office of the President. In addition to her extraordinary professional career, Judith has devoted a substantial amount of time to nonprofit organizations and continues to give back to our community as an active and longtime member of our Board of Visitors here at the College of Law. It is in one of these various capacities that you may have met her or heard from her or seen her around the law school or in Phoenix as a professor of practice with our Phoenix externship program. Judith, it is an honor to have you here today and to thank you for all you have done for our college. I'm proud to recognize you as a recipient of the LCA award. Next, I would like to mention how fortunate the college is to have two distinguished alumni with the names James Rogers. Our second LCA Award recipient, our 1972 alumnus, is James S., but known as Jimmy Rogers. Jimmy's superlative career includes his successful trial advocacy practice, which has garnered him notable recognition, such as selection as one of the best lawyers in America every year since 2003. He, he's a principal lawyer in the law office of James S. Rogers. It's in Seattle, Washington. Uh, for those of you who want mentoring or advice are from or going to the Pacific Northwest, he centers his practice on serious personal injury and product liability litigation. He's affiliated with many national trial lawyer organizations and has been named trial lawyer of the year time and again by his peers. When I've been in his office, he often has to step out. He's taking a call from a client or a potential client and the cases just that have run across 
uh, his desk when we have happened to visit have been uh, extraordinary, often in the headlines in the Seattle area. Jimmy, you have been and continue to be a powerful voice for those who seek redress through our civil justice system. An inspiration to our students here and elsewhere, and we're thrilled to recognize you with an LCA award today. Our next honoree is the University of Arizona Alumni Association's Professional Achievement Award, recognizing alumni who achieved significant prominence in their field of work. Our honoree, Desiree Reed Francois, is unquestionably someone who will fit this bill. A 1997 graduate, Desiree is currently the Director of Athletics at the University of Missouri. Before that, she served as Director of Athletics for UNLV. All told, she has more than two and a half decades of trailblazing experience in intercollegiate athletics. She's a board member of the National Coalition of Minority Football Coaches and has served both as Vice Chair of the NCAA Baseball Selection Committee and as a member of the College Football Playoff Committee's Operations Committee, among her many other professional associations. Desiree, we hope you consider today one of the shining moments in your career, and we are ecstatic to award you the Professional Achievement Award on behalf of the University of Arizona. The University of Arizona's Alumni Association's Distinguished Citizen Award is given to exceptional alumni recognizing extraordinary service to the public or in a nonprofit organization or through volunteer service. Melanie Fontes Rayner, our 2010 alumni, meets all of those criteria with distinction. Melanie current, sir, currently serves as the director of the Office for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where she leads the department's enforcement of federal civil rights and privacy laws and directs related policy and strategic initiatives. <laughs> Prior to that, her work in civil service included serving as counselor to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Secretary, as special assistant to the Attorney General and Chief Healthcare Advisor at the California Department of Justice, where she led a national team to save the Affordable Care Act and protect healthcare coverage for over 133 million Americans. Melanie has also served as the Women's Policy Director for the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, where she helped pass the 21st Century Cures Act, the Every Student Succeeds Act, and the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act. <laughs> Melanie, your work toward improving the lives of women and families is nothing short of extraordinary and I'm honored to award you the University of Arizona Alumni Association's Distinguished Citizen Award. <laughs> what extraordinary careers to see as a model. Graduates, it's time. We now move to a moment that our graduates, and I suspect every single person in this room, has been anticipating with both excitement and profound pride. It's time to walk the walk. We're proud of all of you. Professor Andrew Shepard will call the names for SJD and LLM students. 
and Professor Keith Swisher will call the names of MLS, MPS, and graduate certificate students. I will introduce the name callers for our JD when we get to that point of the program. Andrew. Vishal Gaikawar. Irene LeMay. Matthew Ombe. And now for our LM students, Claude Dorfel. Eduardo de Jesus Hernandez Herrera. Shanta Batray. Munjer Bazumder. Shirley Bett. Vicente Rios Velasco. Blessing Adejo. Good afternoon, students, family, and friends. It is my honor and joy to get, the read, to get to announce the names of three groups of College of Law graduates, the Master of Legal Studies, or MLS, the Master of Professional Studies, or MPS, and the graduate certificates, including legal paraprofessional, aging law and policy, health care for health care, health law for health care professionals. Uh, uh, what am I forgetting? <laughs> There's a couple others. Anyway, regulatory science and uh, information privacy, compliance, and data security. Um, with that, let's begin the reading. Jennifer Chambers. Broderick Moore. <laughs> Michelle Bentavenia. <laughs> Sylvia Cavalcant. Charlene A. Briggs. Danielle Washington Wright. Suzanne Abramson. Leilani Martinez. <laughs> R 
Rebecca Perez. Lily Beth Valenzuela Maddox. <laughs> Brendan Hove. Braddock Chow. Maria Teresa Irvin. <laughs> Kayla Bat Hernandez. <laughs> Joanna McLean. Carrie Powers. <laughs> Diola Wan. <laughs> Arlena Mitchell. Johnson Delusa. <laughs> Earl Trapp. <laughs> Matthew Haley. Tabitha Correa. <laughs> Justin Garcia. <laughs> Nathan Prazu. Ann Kotliba. <laughs> Carol Sprecher. <laughs> Clifton Diaz. Jacqueline Magaisa. <laughs> Holly Graff. <laughs> Tara Whiteside. Amy Weber Wells, Rika Gail Pender, Laura Rittenauer. Dylan Warwick. Woo! 
Onita Christensen. Jamie Harris. Nancy Martinez. Sherry Gamage. Jason Strong. <laughs> Diane Schmidt. <laughs> Jessica Pazzanelli. Gina Fembrez Leon Guerrero. Aaron Goodrich. Jasmine Amani Harper. Rachel Lynn Miner. Adele Montijo. Shauna Janvier. Taylor Yor Lauren Yazi. <laughs> Marissa Doreen Morris. <laughs> Alexandra Rascon. Wendy Zamora. <laughs> Victoria Chamberlain Siros. <laughs> Yahara Navarro. Haruna Dama. <laughs> Daniel Hernandez. <laughs> Adeline Ibarra. Stephen Dunn. <laughs> Joseph Agostini.
Michael Joseph Corey. Two more LLMs, Kimberly Otieno. <laughs> Idos Amir Galayev. Professor Susie Salmon and Professor Chris Griffin will read the names of students receiving the JD degree. Andrew Donnellan. Jacob Irwin. Julia Van Horn. Sierra Rhodes. Elizabeth Hanna. Jeremy Thompson. Max Larnard. Derek Kilgore. <laughs> Anthony Soldo Merkai. Douglas Weikstra. <laughs> Kyle Lochner. Scott Kirker. Braxton Chipman. Roy Barry Maki. <laughs> Joseph Russo's Hammond. Jahangir Daruvala. <laughs> Isai Estevez.
Kevin Kent. Milka Altamirano. Brian Robles. Jay's Beecroft Flake. Ben Kaler. Alana Zorfus. Kristen Wallach. Drew Minnick. <laughs> Kieran Kaur. <laughs> Amber Shepard. Sonam Dixit. <laughs> Ibrahim Al Hudaythi. Rebecca Caro Cohen. <laughs> Julia Rose Aguilera. Geneva R. Kami Parks. Alisa Dormer. Haley Stewart. Annalisa Skeen. Brennan Marshall. Marvin Slepian.
Tyler Malm. Luke Yoshida. <laughs> Gaetano Forte. Gloria Farisi. <laughs> Katerina Granger. <laughs> Riley Hem. Scott Glanzel. Gabrielle Ada Martin. Austin Quick. Victoria Roberts. Pearl Dixon. Ashley Sirk. Madison Johnson. Brendan Cauda. Aaron Rickle. Brianna Arlene Rodriguez. Fletcher Nolan Dirks. <laughs> Jacob Marsh. John Christopher Kelly. <laughs> Madeline Gag. <laughs> Megan Tobin.
Sarah Gerstel. Nathaniel Ruendhaug. Nikith Shivali. Mao Yu Wong. <laughs> Rob Tutin. Andrea Seach. Aaron Weaver. Blaze Bowles. James Edward Sarasia. Krista Avanenti. Paige Gavin Ricks. Marley Grosskopf. Mariam Sortigi. So Kunvati Song. <laughs> Vedat Teke. Sunan Seth. Sampia Sak. Tyler Hodgen. Yeah, Oscar Fimbres Reese. Matthew Mansour. (laughs) 
Jonathan Becker. Thomas Corrigan. Isabella Stotenberg. <laughs> Romy Sandoval. Bryn Wells Edwards. Katie Lee Brown. Tomas Montoya. Michael Combrink. <laughs> Christian Weber. Jesse Jordan. Ryan Willie. Luis Torero. Cassidy Vernon. <laughs> Kelly McDonald. <laughs> Kate Bartholomew. Nick Johnson. <laughs> Carolyn Jane Snyder Pommier. <laughs> Angela Kim. Emily Thomason. <laughs> Alyssa Aguira. <laughs> Matthew Abraham. Dennis Chow.
Dirk Bernhard. Anna Christensen. Rachel Chrysler. Michael Sale. Gayane Chikaroyan. Let me see, um, does that mean we're done? No, not quite. There are magic words. They make your degree official and here they are. By the authority transferred to me for this ceremony by Dr. Robert Robbins and vested in him by the Arizona Board of Regents, I confer on you the applicable degrees of Juris Doctor, Master of Laws, Master in Policy Studies, Master in Legal Studies, Graduate Certificate, or SJD. You now have the degrees. So, to everyone who joined us today for this joyous celebration, thank you. Please stay seated to allow our new graduates to recess from the hall in a last moment of ceremony. And let me conclude with the words of two of my favorite 20th century philosophers, John Lennon and a man who spoke at graduation last night, Paul McCartney. And in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Congratulations, graduates. Yeah.